Hello, beautiful alchemist. Welcome to Reiki Radio. I am your host, Yolanda. And today we have a great conversation about Reiki and mindset. So a lot of people, um, I don't know if a lot of people focus on how connected our mindset is to Reiki, although it's really embedded within the system and within the techniques. But even beyond that, there's the side of where a lot of people want to work with Reiki to go through their healing process so they can be more conscious creators of their lives, their paths, their healing, all of these things. So today we are going to talk with Gwen Allison, who is the founder of myspiritualbutterfly.com. And Gwen's work focuses very much on mindset and Reiki. So she is a successful transformational life coach and expert Reiki master teacher. And her spiritual journey started over 15 years ago with the discovery of inspirational teachings, such as the law of attraction and the secret. And we'll hear a bit about how her journey started, um, how she focuses on relationship energy and why, because of what she's gone through uh, very personally in her life. But she became an advanced life coach in 2008 and a Yusui Reiki practitioner in 2015. And around that time is when she started her holistic business. And she also supports Reiki practitioners with developing not just Reiki and Reiki classes, but also their Reiki businesses as well. And we will talk about all of this, but I hope you enjoy this magical conversation. Again, her name is Gwen Allison, and you can learn more about her work at myspiritualbutterfly.com. You can also follow Gwen on Instagram at myspiritualbutterfly. But for now, let's enjoy this conversation, and I will see you on the other side. Okay, everyone, welcome to Reiki Radio. Today we are here with the beautiful Gwen Allison of myspiritualbutterfly.com. Thank you for coming to have this conversation with me today, love. Oh, thank you for having me, Yolanda. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really excited. <laughs> yes, me too. I just want to let everyone know that you'll also see Gwen in the upcoming Reiki Rays Global Healing Summit. So mm -hmm. Really looking forward to that. She shares a lot about empaths. But today, I'm going to pick her brain about mindset techniques and her work with Reiki. So first of all, I saw that um, how you landed into this work, it happened after a very difficult situation in your life. So could you tell us a little bit about your background and what got you started in this? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I... I was sort of brought up as a Catholic, um, which kind of gave me my initial connection to the divine, you could say, or spirituality. Um, I do remember when I was younger, um, I've been saying that to you in the last interview, being five and being able to see like what I now know is my aura when I looked at my hand and understanding that these layers of thoughts going on in my head so I could think something, observe that I was thinking something, observe that I was observing myself thinking something. It's so, so strange. And all these things would happen um, in terms of things I might see or sense. But as I got older, this can happen with a lot of us, that kind of got put by the wayside, I guess, kind right. of knocked out of us. You have to get on with life. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I kind of, as I said, started as a Catholic, which was great, gave me that kind of spiritual connection initially in prayer and things like that. But I had a lot of unanswered questions uh, and I spent my teens, uh, almost early 20s, looking at different sort of um, religions and practices and things like that, just looking for the answer. And it wasn't until I was, I was kind of going through a divorce. Um, this was, you know, several years ago now, probably over 20 years ago now. Um, my daughter at the time was like five years old. I was going through a, a divorce and I was discovering things like the law of attraction uh, and the secret and Deepak Chopra and it was just blowing my mind I was like oh my god this is what I've been looking for for so long uh, it really landed it felt like it filled a void that had been in me for all that time um, understanding that we could create our reality <clears throat> that we weren't just um, put on this earth just to have things happen to us you know without any control and then we die and that's it so yeah. it was really empowering to discover that, particularly going through what I was going through at the time with the divorce 
because I was able to, two things happened. I was able to see the next stage of my life and plan that, if that makes sense, set some intentions around that and create that um, uh, more powerfully. But also I was able to sort of view my ex-husband or my husband at the time with a bit more compassion. So Mm. I really connected with his pain. I was able to see the pain that my decision had caused, not just him, but, you know, his, you know, the family around us and my daughter and everything else. Um, And so although I still wanted to go ahead with the divorce, it made us go through that in a much more sort of compassionate, friendly way. Initially, we were at loggerheads, I'm not going to lie. But with that epiphany, I realized that I could I could just transform how we we did all of that. Uh, and he's still like one of my best friends today, my go-to person today. Um, so that was kind of initially how it started. It was around about that time that I discovered Reiki. Um, and I was very left brain still. So I was still, still very much in corporate. I love the law of attraction. It felt really logical to me, but I hadn't tried any kind of energy modality. It was around about that time, sort of 2008, that I started my life coaching business as well. Um, but I decided to try uh, Reiki for the first time, just to see if it would help me kind of heal through everything sort of a lot more quickly. Uh, and I remember going to um, a local sort of Buddhist center where this person was and I had my appointment and, you know, she was dressed in this white coat and I'm like, oh, is that Dr. Reiki? <laughs> <What's going on? laughs> um, and I don't remember what she told me about it too much, um, but I remember lying there. She worked hands off. I don't remember feeling very much. And I just remember feeling a bit of warmth where she was placing her hands uh, and then at the end of the session, she charged me some money back in the day. It was like 40 pounds. I was like, oh my God, this is such a scam. <laughs> she hasn't even done anything. Um, but now I understand I just wasn't, uh, the energy was was happening. The Reiki was happening. I just wasn't on that frequency. I was still very left brained. But yeah. that was my first introduction to Reiki. And then flick forward seven years later, I was going through another breakup. Definitely the theme for my life here, I think. I uh, wanted to heal really quickly. I was like a single mom. I was working in IT, managing. I was doing all these things myself. And um, uh, I, I kind of went through this breakup, but this guy was a little bit kind of controlling initially. Um, and I wanted, again, to heal really quickly. Reiki kept coming up. And I was like, no, I've been there, done that, not for me. Mm-hmm. And then I thought, you know, I'm going to learn this. It keeps coming up. So maybe I need to kind of understand how it should be done properly. She was doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And I literally um, did my Reiki one. I remember at the time at the classes I did with my Reiki master were quite big. Um, And I remember sort of these people who were experiencing all these amazing things. They were seeing things, sensing things, and seeing colors, lovely visions. And I remember just comparing myself to them, thinking I can feel some heat and tingling in my hands um I can see this white whenever I did like the attunement and things like that yeah um and I I felt this feeling of love but I didn't think it was anywhere near enough compared to what they were going through right so I, I just didn't feel that I had what it took to be able to service people and give people a good healing because I wouldn't be able to tell them anything about what was happening to them uh and literally during the break learning my Reiki one during the break I was feeling sorry for myself and um, I remember my Reiki master's uh, mom coming to me because she was helping him with the the, the treatments. Um, and my Reiki master's Torsten Lang, by the way. Oh. And um, yeah, yeah. And he's an amazing, really lovely class, really big classes. Um, and then, yeah, she his mom came up to me during the break and she said, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself eating my biscuit. And she was like, you know, you have the brightest light than anybody else in the room. Oh, I was like, really? <laughs> But if she hadn't have said that to me, whether it's true or not, if she hadn't have said it to me, I would not be sitting here today. I wouldn't be teaching or be doing this as a career, whether it's, you know, the Reiki or the coaching. Um, so that kind of set me on the path to, to Reiki. And as I started practicing my Reiki, doing myself Reiki every day, I started to feel more and more energy. I could feel it in my spine, feel it in my back. And now I feel energy all the time, everywhere, in conversations, in reading a book or anything. I can just feel that energy come through. She's amazing. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my spiritual journey. Um, I also meditate 
daily as well. I love people like Dr. Joe Dispenza and he started me yeah. on the road in 2015 to meditating for 40 minutes and loving it. So it was really easy for me to attach all my daily Reiki practice uh, to that. And yeah, so it's just literally both Reiki and meditation have changed my whole life, you know, just made me calmer. Um, it's helped me with my my daughter through her teenage stage and even now being able to help her remotely with Reiki. Um, it, it's just giving me a different perspective and, um, you know, a deeper connection, I think, as well to, to all that is, to spirituality, to the divine. Um, my mum sadly passed away in 2019 and it helped me move through that in a really powerful way. Yeah. And she's still comes in for me I call her in when I'm doing my Reiki she's always with me yeah. um so yeah that's kind of my my spiritual journey um 2015 was a transformational time for me this is when I had that breakup and I learned Reiki I also learned um and trained in Psyche uh, and the emotion code I kind of gathered all these wonderful modalities and energy modalities which I use in my coaching today as well so yeah it was a transformational time <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like it. It's funny. I have a f different questions for you. Some about Reiki, some about the the law of attraction and these things. Oh, so yeah. a couple of things you said is so interesting is um, that desire to want to heal faster. And mm -hmm. I want to ask you about that and what you learned in the process. So like when you started, was it actually faster for you or you know, what was the experience of healing? Was it different than what you expected? these sorts of things so I'll start with that yeah no definitely for me it was faster mm -hmm. uh, I would say prior to that and I know that if I went through any kind of breakup I would be kind of almost in that heartbreak mode for a year uh, it would take me a long time to go over that person yeah um and so with focusing on myself and my goals and doing the daily healing uh, the meditation for because that's in that last relationship I literally had lost my direction I mm -hmm. I'd just lost everything that I wanted to do I was doing the life coaching on the side I was working full-time um, but it's like when you meet someone who um, perhaps is like okay arranging everything doing everything for you I just surrendered to all of that but it went a bit too it was just too much control but yeah so realizing I'd lost um, my focus and my drive and you know, what do I actually want to do? You know, looking at these different modalities, they definitely did help me to work on my limiting beliefs, yeah. uh, which is definitely something you do with um, Psyche. It's all about that kind of thing, uh, transforming your beliefs, using your, your body as a lie detector almost to know what's true, what, what's false. So you're doing a lot of what's called muscle testing. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anyone doesn't know what that is, if you're um, usually if you're telling the truth all of your nerve, nerves will fire really strongly and if something is not true for you it will weaken so um, using that to pinpoint exactly what the belief was that was holding me back um, and then to do some balances they call it to kind of clear that then test again to see if it's yeah that's that's fine now this is now my truth so that was really powerful um obviously reiki going deeper in a more subtle subliminal level you don't always know what it's working on but you set that intention and you can feel um that day by day you're you're becoming more fortified more stronger more calmer um and as i said more sort of focused on, on what you want um so definitely reiki was a big part of that healing process because you don't need to talk with reiki you just feel you just sense and it goes deep it, it can connect to those layers. Um, you can't hide from it, basically, in terms mm -hmm. of your healing. Um, with the emotion code, that was beautiful. And I do this with my clients today, just being able to liberate the heart. So whenever we're going through anything, um, any strong emotions, heartbreak, rejection, whether we're with a love relationship or family or friends, we kind of protect ourselves a little bit. That emotion gets stuck around our heart and in various organs of the body, but particularly if it's relationships around the heart, and although it serves to protect us, it also keeps people away from us. So mm -hmm. then when we're ready to kind of, we think, yeah, I wouldn't mind finding a relationship, that energy radiates out from us and it blocks people from coming to us because they can, you know, in a subconscious way, they can sense there's something there, a bit of a wall there. So the emotion code, um, which is something that was created by Bradley Nelson, 
um, is a really beautiful way. Again, using some muscle testing to get to the exact emotion. You use magnets to release that energy because we're all electromagnetic. Um, so that is a nice way. That's one of the ways I, I kind of definitely healed my heart as well. And mm -hmm. that took a long time to release the emotions that were trapped there. And you can actually go back to the exact time it became trapped. So it could have been something that happened when you were five, um, you know, a rejection or an abandonment or feeling hopeless, not feeling discouraged. Could be all of that. You can go back to the exact point. It could even be in the womb. It could be ancestral. Um, so that also was a big part of my healing journey. So it was a lot quicker than yeah. a year because of all those components. Um, and probably it didn't take too long. Um, I would say maybe a few weeks, a couple of months before I was feeling, yeah, stronger. Didn't necessarily want to go out and start dating, but I was, I wanted to focus more on myself. I wanted to, I had that realization that I needed to kind of heal me first before I go calling anyone else in. Yeah. Um, so it was that, that that was definitely the start of my journey. It's so uh, interesting yeah. you say this, Gwen, because I think a lot of us, you know, have some resistance around it initially. And I think it's just because we're so used to looking outside of us and looking at what the other people do or other person does and what it is they could have changed or done better or what they did to us. And I think it mm -hmm. takes um, it's a light bulb goes off when we finally do surrender to that self-reflection mm -hmm. bit. So I wanted to ask you a bit about that because I know that's a big part of your work as well. I mean, just the aspect of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. And again, a lot of times there's resistance around that because it can be hard sometimes to be vulnerable with ourselves and notice what our part is in the life that we're creating. So could you talk a little bit about that? Like when you started recognizing the pieces that you were holding and maybe your choices and how you were interacting with things. How was that for mm. you? And how do you support people through that? Oh, yeah. I mean, for myself, and I guess through my journey, I have been able to help people through that. But yeah. particularly with relationships, as I said, that's my theme. But the, the first thing you do is you do look, you look at, you have to, because you have to take ownership. If you don't own it and take responsibility, you can't heal it and change it. Right. You're constantly blaming someone else. Uh, you're not condoning what they're doing, but if you keep blaming them, that's making you completely powerless. You know, you're moving into victim mode. Unless they change, you're saying you can't change. Right. And so, yeah, you do start to look inward. What in me is attracting that type of person? Mm -hmm. And having to, as you said, be vulnerable and own that. I'm what am I looking for? I'm obviously looking for love. I haven't maybe I've not had that as a child in, in the way that I wanted from my parents or, you know, um what what sort of um examples of love am I going by so a lot of the time it's one understanding how you were treated as a child and how that's affecting your choices now if we have a really strong father wound we would, may attract that in our partners um, as a way of thinking okay I couldn't fix it then maybe I can fix it now if I can elicit love from this person mm -hmm. then that kind of validates that I'm worthy that I'm lovable all of that so there's a little bit of that kind of going on in who we're attracting uh, when we become, you know, adults, when we're older. Um, there's also, there can be a rebellion there. There very much was with me. My dad was very kind of violent in the home. And so, and I wasn't really able to defend myself or anything like that or, you know, support my mom or, you know, my family. And so you kind of then end up being really rebellious and taking on a lot more of the wounded masculine yourself. And in your relationships, that comes out, the wounded masculine, how dare you, you know, you you want to control the relationship for one. Um, and you you then want to stand up for yourself. And sometimes that may be misplaced. Right. You know, you don't want to be vulnerable. So you really close your heart sometimes to the other person um, because you don't want to get hurt. But you also get very defensive and very masculine in how you're being in that relationship which can cause problems, you know, if you have to, um, if you're looking for a divine masculine yourself and you're the wounded masculine, it's going to be difficult for that. So that was a one of the sort of epiphanies as well. Um, but yeah, it's just owning it and, and doing the work you need to do um, and loving, self-love was so, so, so important. Um, and, you know, myself included, a lot of us struggle 
with that self-love and we're calling other people to love us you know think of our little inner child sitting there wounded still and she just wants us to sit with her but we're calling everybody else in we're running away from her we're not giving her that time to feel what she's feeling understand why she's feeling what she's feeling so self-love plays a big part in that and once you I definitely do a lot of work with that with my my clients my coaching clients once you build the self-love the self-worth you start making different choices because you you just won't tolerate um, anyone treating you less than you treat yourself but if you're coming from a place of wounded you almost believe you deserve to be treated that way um you know or you may be looking to fix someone else when you should be looking to fix yourself first yeah. then you're attracting people who need to be fixed <laughs> we're attracting that um so every you start to realize that everything is a reflection of what's going on inside of you and so it has to start with you um so we definitely do that work on self-love and then everything starts to shift around you. You're radiating out a different energy. You start attracting a different frequency of person because you're also on a different frequency. Um, so it becomes really powerful, not just in love relationships, but friendships. People don't match that frequency, will drop away. We all know sometimes we lose our friends when we're on this journey. Uh, friends we've, we've known for years can fall away, that kind of thing. If they're not matching the frequency where you are now, that can happen. Um, but the, the, the key thing is I was, I was very much after that previous relationship, I was avoidant for a long time. For many right. years, I didn't want to bring someone else into my life. I created quite a nice, peaceful life of me and my daughter. Um, I was kind of working on my business and Reiki and coaching. I created this really nice bubble for myself. Uh, part of me did want a partner, but it wasn't always um, so prevalent. After a while, it stopped being a priority for me. But I, I realized a lot of it was fear. You know, I was frightened of going back in the arena again and, you know, perhaps having someone destroy my peace. But again, I had another epiphany through meditation that the journey has to continue in the relationship. I can do all this lovely work on my own. Um, like the analogy I always use is having a fear of flying and you do all this stuff on the ground, you do your hypnosis, you do all these different things, you go through coaching, but you never get on a plane. Right. You have to get on the plane to know what's worked and to put into practice what you've learned. Um, and so that's the biggest thing, sort of understanding where in previous relationships I've not really been my authentic self. I've not really been vulnerable because I've been putting on this masculine mask, um, which I'd had to do for work as well. Being a, a manager, we have to kind of tap into our masculine energy, our leadership energy. We then bring that into the relationship at home. And then we wonder why that doesn't quite work out, you know? So uh, yeah, so many kind of um, epiphanies that I had myself that I then share with my clients and walk them through that so they can understand um uh, and then I guess the final thing as well is recognizing that I me growing up and a lot of us growing up didn't have uh the ideal role model of a relationship we didn't have we didn't know what that should be you know if you had parents who always argued not many people can identify a relationship that was like this is perfect where we can do that is on Disney you know we're looking at Disney we're reading Mills and Boone we've got this fantasy idea of what a relationship should be like and so our expectations of the relationship are super super high and completely impossible Right. You know, we put a lot of pressure on our partner to be this knight in shining armor, this prince and, you know, this savior, this savior and all of that. Um, and so, yeah, we have to kind of have a more realistic expectation uh, and accept our role in what's going on and, and how we can, um, as the, the divine feminine, kind of nurture and nourish the energy of the relationship. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot <laughs> that I've learned in my time around you know relationships particularly but relationships with ourselves too that I'm able to kind of help uh, my clients through uh, and they recognize it they they acknowledge that kind of what's been happening and what is happening but the fact that they have that power now means that they can shift a lot of that and work with a lot of that with the law of attraction what do you want we're always quite vocal about what we don't want, what we don't like. Not enough men out there. We don't like this. I don't want that. I haven't got any money. All of the lack side, we're really quick to verbalize that. And we don't actually take time to spin the energy around what we do want mm. and tap into that and line up with that. 
So it's kind of refocusing people on that. Okay, what do you want? Enough of blaming that person now and being in to me consciousness, as Michael Beckwith calls it. We need to elevate up now um, in order for you to live the life you want to live and see the things you want to see. So, yeah. Well, it's interesting listening to you describe all of this because it makes me think about the whole mindset thing. So with mm. law of attraction, it's such an interesting topic because you have some people that really do see the benefit and then other people that really have challenges around it. And so I mm. wanted to ask you about this because it sounds like with the work that you do with helping people to really acknowledge themselves and acknowledge what they're holding, it's if it sounds almost like mindset to prepare you for mindset. So could you talk a yeah. little bit about that? Like the importance of, you know, I can't just say I want a great relationship, but really if in the background, what I'm saying is something totally different mm. or like the frequency, like you mentioned that my frequency is saying something else. So mm -hmm. how important is that to kind of set your mindset up <laughs> before going deep into the desired outcomes? Yeah, it's really important because everything starts from a thought. Your beliefs are created by a repeated thought. Your emotions are triggered by those thoughts. And then, you know, your thoughts and your emotions and your words, they all radiate out of frequency. So if they're not actually in alignment with what you want, you're just going to, you're going to see reflected back to you mm -hmm. uh, exactly, you know, what you're radiating out 100%. So if we're able to, even a little bit of possibility, you know, a, a, a positive thought is much more powerful than a negative thought in terms of creation. So even if you have all day of moaning, Yolanda, I know you don't, <laughs> but if you did, and you just had a morning of gratitude or positive thinking about what you want and getting to the feeling space, or a lot of people love to script and write down like a story about what they want, even if that takes you five minutes, that's five minutes of pure positive thinking, that's really powerful, exponentially more powerful than the day of negative thought that kind of happens. And in fact, it raises your vibration as you go through the day. So then you kind of have less to moan about. Um, so yeah, what the mindset is key to all of it, if I'm honest, how you're perceiving things, what you're making things mean. Nothing in this world has any meaning apart from what we give it. So if someone looks at you funny, uh, or someone doesn't return your call or somebody says something in a certain tone, we can choose to make that mean whatever we want. Right. You know, it can mean, oh, they don't like me. Oh my God, nobody likes me. Or it can mean they're just having a bad day. Hope they're okay. Right. You know, so all of these things are the mindset, but a lot of us have initially, we have quite a critical way of thinking about ourselves. We would never say these things that we say to ourselves to anybody else but we allow them just to flourish in our mind and grow and we believe them uh, and then we act accordingly. But yeah, we whatever we're thinking, saying, feeling, we'll see that reflected back in our reality because that's how powerful we are. And if we remember, tying in a little bit of Reiki here, if we remember the second symbol, the Sahiki symbol, it is all about the fact that what's going on out there in our reality starts from in here, starts from internally. So that's all about thought. It's all about that symbol is all about, you know, negative thinking, bad habits, incorrect thinking, because that incorrect thinking can lead to anxiety, depression, all of this all starts from an incorrect thought usually. Yeah. Um, so our mindset is the powerful piece to all of it. You know, when, when we get that right, we will start speaking differently about ourselves, saying different things, being more sort of encouraging, um, using more empowering words. We'll also then, when we're thinking differently, feel differently. Um, so the mindset is good because that judgment of others and whether we turn it on ourselves is important. If we're feeling a bit anxious and we don't check in with the mind about that in terms of, okay, I'm feeling this anxiety rather than going down the road. Oh my God, I can't do it. I'm feeling anxious. This feels awful. Becoming a little bit mindful. So kind of saying, okay, why am I feeling this? I'm feeling this emotion of anxiety. What's going on? Soothing ourselves. It's okay. You can get through this. Just breathe. Just stop having that compassion. That all starts in the mind, doesn't it? It's how we're thinking about what's going on and what we're making it mean. So we can either downward spiral or we can soothe it and then gradually we start kind of going up with that mentality. Um, and then if we're, if we're repeating that, committing to practice that, and all of this is a practice, it isn't, 
that you know you just do this for one day and suddenly you know right because we're going to be challenged that the universe isn't silly it's going to test us it's, it's going to give us an opportunity to see have you actually changed have you learned this lesson as fully as you think you have so we will see these things appearing that we thought that we got kind of gotten rid of and overcome and it's how we react to it that's the thing that tells yeah. us okay we've changed before I would have gone crazy and this person would have triggered me and I would have shattered right. them but now I know I, you know I breathe through that or I work through that or I pause or I walked away or I just saw saw them with compassion completely different so to be honest, I think it all starts with the mind, it all starts with the mind. Yeah. I love that you bring that up. Um, one thing you remind me of, I think it was, it had to be two or three years ago. It was during um, the pandemic. I was on the East coast at the time and I came across that book called the magic, which came after the secret, but it basically is a book that every day has a different point of focus so that you do take that time you were talking about, like taking time every day for positive thinking. There are very specific questions and starting my morning like that was, mm -hmm. it was incredible. So I love that you mm -hmm. say that, but with what you're saying too, going on the Reiki side of the fence, it reminds me of so many people have the experience you had of comparing themselves to others. And, you know, a lot of times we worry if we're good enough of a practitioner. So our minds are mm -hmm. focused on like this fear of being good enough or this fear of, is it working? Just all kinds of mm -hmm. fear and worry. And mm -hmm. as we go deeper into our practice, hopefully, <laughs> we start to mm -hmm. recognize how so many elements in the system are pointing to our direction of mind, whether it's the Gokai or, you know, just bringing our minds down into the Hara or Lower Dandian, right? That mm -hmm. point that you're making, even Reiki guides us to where is your mind? Mm -hmm. Where is your mind? So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you a little bit about that because you can see from everything you're saying how they work hand in hand. Mm -hmm. How does that mm -hmm blend for you did you make kind of a partnership between the two or how have Absolutely. they influenced each other that, it, it, totally with the gakai the reiki principles that is crucial Mikao yusui was very deliberate in that mm -hmm. repeating that bringing you health and happiness so i'm very what i tend to do in my classes is teach that as a sort of mini coaching session so we mm -hmm. look at anger um and and the thought behind it and um uh, you know, the judgment may be behind it, but also the fact that the emotion, anything in us that comes up as an emotion is not bad. It has right. information, it has a message. So that kind of brings in the mindful piece of uh, anger um, and how can we sit with it, move through it. Uh, and we go through various things. And of course, we've got Reiki to help us move through it as well. But again, it's a thought. It's, it's, it's sometimes with anger, particularly, it's never about that moment. It's almost like a secondary emotion. It's always about not feeling respected, heard, seen, loved, and it could go back to childhood. So when we become mindful, and this is what I love about Reiki, because it's very much interspersed with the Buddhist practices around this um, and heavily influenced by, by Buddhism. Um, but when we become mindful about our anger, we can get the message from it. We can then set an intention to be different the next time that person triggers us or says something. Um, but sometimes it's also there's a lot of acceptance there that we're feeling this. Um, everybody feels angry. Dalai Lama says he feels angry sometimes. So yes. there's an acceptance there. Um, and then once we've kind of got that information and we've calmed down, taken the charge out of it, we may still want to honor the anger. We may still want to say something. Um, and so that the, the, the change in thought, which uh, Mikhail Usui talks about, and he talks about on his memorial stone, there's change in thought happening in the world is literally us understanding the power of thought to soothe ourselves and move us through our emotions and sit with our emotions. Um, and the same with worry. As you said, if we're, we're worrying, we start to understand um, that that just creates, as you said, more to worry about. We end up kind of blocking ourselves a little bit. We're trying to give a, a really good treatment that we're going into. What if it doesn't work? What if they don't feel anything? Um, and then the more we can kind of get out of the way, let go, surrender, move into maybe gratitude uh, and just trust, you know, that it's going to work. The more, you know, we end up enjoying it. And if they fall asleep, it doesn't matter. They're getting what they need. So a lot of it is getting that, 
um, the self-doubt and the ego out of the way. But when we refer to the principles and we're reciting that daily, just for today, do not worry. Um, we just start to realize how futile it is, you know, with the law of attraction coming in again. We're choosing a possibility out of a million different possibilities and we're focusing on that possibility of all of our energy we're visualizing we're hearing conversations we're rehearsing things in our mind and we're weaving 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 um and so when we catch ourselves doing that you know again we can get mindful about that soothe it choose a different thought in that moment you know what if it goes wrong or what if it goes right you know in that moment we understand we can do that um and so that it's lovely to reference the gakai because that just for today means we have to have that compassion for ourselves tomorrow we can start again you know in this in the next moment we can try again um so yeah a lot of students have that worry what if it doesn't work for i don't feel anything just keep doing it the the more we can move out of the left side of our brain um the more we can experience but it's always working regardless as my own story kind of testifies to that yes it's always working and they'll get the validation from the people they're they're giving reiki to um but yeah the more we can get out of the way and trust and just be there to one of my students had a really nice mantra for herself which was just surrender receive and give and it was just such a nice thing to kind of say in your mind um but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, it does. And it makes me, yeah. And, you know, because of everything you're saying too, I know that a big part of your work is meditation. And mm-hmm. that I remember years ago, I would say, if I could only practice one thing, it would be meditation because mm-hmm. I realized in meditative spaces, how rigid of mind I was, you know, just out of habit and not even being aware that I was right. And Mm -hmm. even though, you know, taking information in like what we learn in Reiki classes and, and that's the thing, like we're hungry for information. We want to know, we want to know. Right. (laughs) But I couldn't really get it or understand it till I got out of the way applied and then saw and witnessed the changes that were happening. But meditation really was the key to help me soften my mind to really help me surrender. And I wanted to ask you a bit about this because a lot of people are in that fight, that tug of war of, I get it, but I just can't, or this is just not how I am, or I just, you know, Mm -hmm. the stories of it all. Could Mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how significant meditation has been for you? But also you mentioned that you enjoyed Joe Dispenza. And I have to tell you, Mm -hmm. I was looking at your website and you have a side note everyone go to her website myspiritualbutterfly.com she has so much great content there but on the free resources part you list some books that you like and the Jill Dispenza book that you listed that was my introduction to him and he had come to San Diego uh, to a spiritualist church and at that time it was before he really you know, became so well recognized it was like $20 for the event and we got a copy of that book as part of the, yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, (laughs) and now he's all over the place. Yeah. But Mm -hmm. so how has his work, but even just meditation in general, how has that added to all of this that you've been doing? Mm -hmm. So his work has been, that was my starting ground, I think in 2015, just discovering his work. I was going through, uh, as I said, the breakup. I think it helps as well when you, as I said, Michael Beckwith says, pain pushes you, your vision pulls you, pain pushes you. My pain was pushing me in terms of relationships and things like that and the things I wanted to do with my business and um, doing his workshops, everything just landed because he uses a lot of science to help us understand what's going on when we're in that alpha, theta brainwave state where the hypnotists work for good reason, we are more able to access, access our subconscious mind and make a change. You know, when we're up until the age of seven, our subconscious mind is wide open. We're like a sponge, children absorbing everything and anything and learning new languages and playing loads of different instruments and things like that. They have no filter, you know, which is why we also have to be careful what we say to them at those ages because they're taking it straight in. As we get older, we move into beta brainwave states, which is like full consciousness, basically. And then it becomes harder to make a change. So when you are at that point where, do you know what, something has to shift for me, you hit that point where I've had enough, you know, 
and sick and tired of being sick and tired type thing. Yeah. Then that was Joe Dispenza for me. It was like, I want to sit down. I'm going to do these meditations. He has a meditations around your intentions so you can manifest what you want. Um, but they are long. They're like 40 minutes. Um, and initially I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And it's really hard. And, <laughs> but it just, the more you sit down, you're taming your body. Um, because your subconscious, your body wants to move, you know, wants to go and have a coffee, go and make this. And why are you sitting here? You should be doing this. All of these <laughs> things go through your mind. But when you understand that it's normal for that to happen and that we maybe set smaller goals, so maybe not do 40 minutes like I did right off the bat, but you can just sit down for one minute, five minutes. Right. And it's about mastering yourself and your body. Your meditation can be whatever works for you. It could be a guided meditation. It could be a visualization. It could be chanting. Uh, it could be the breath, which is, I, I feel, one of the most powerful. Um, but whatever it is, you're just doing that for a minute or five minutes and sit in that space. It feels less challenging. And then you're able to build up over time. Um, but your mind will wonder. That's what the mind does. But yeah. for me, the important thing is just to keep that thought soothing as opposed to critical. That's the main thing. Mm -hmm. But you will kind of, your mind will think. And then the, the important thing is you come back to whatever you're focused on, the breath, the candle, the, the voice guiding you. And you don't chastise yourself. So you just notice you're lost in thought. Okay, come back to the breath. Yeah, That's it. That really is the victory because you're making a choice to do something other than just think that thought. You're like, oh, okay, I'm going to do this instead. And in time, that gets a little bit sort of easier. And you may have gaps between thoughts. It might just be milliseconds. It may not be a lot of time. But the aim isn't to stop thought. It's mainly to calm the mind you know, maybe tame the body, although you can do meditation as a walking meditation. Some people hit that state when they're cycling or running. Um, so you find yoga as well, movements so as something that kind of works for you, that's making you more sort of either go inward or be more mindful mm. uh, is going to be really powerful. But the key thing is to not criticize yourself if you feel, oh, I haven't done it. Because sometimes there's a message for you. And if your mind is always trying to come back to the breath and stopping thought, you're not going to get that message. Esther Hicks from Abraham Hicks said the same thing. She was so focused on the breath that Abraham found it hard initially to kind of get through to her. Yeah. Um, and so, because she wouldn't let her mind wander. So sometimes it, it wanders to actually for you to receive something, you know, some information or a message, but the key thing is to be compassionate start small the benefits are immense from daily meditation for our physical body uh blood pressure heart you know lowering our heart rate decreasing stress insomnia asthma pain management more intelligence more compassion forgiveness um you know digesting our food properly all of those things are affected by stress um scientifically proven to be you know benefited by daily meditation um, and I like daily meditation as opposed to once a week, because doing something 365 times a year is going to give you great benefit compared to just once a week. Oh, um, but it also gives you that place to process, um, process your, your emotions and things you've been going through, as well as connecting to your higher self um, and going more deeper. It's interesting you say that. I just when I first started uh, with Reiki, I was taking meditation classes at the same time. And I was doing meditation every day and I would notice if there was a day for whatever reason, I didn't start in meditation. Mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. to notice a drastic difference in just how I functioned, my mood, all kinds of things mm -hmm. if I didn't start my day that way. But you also remind me of um, one of the things I focus a lot on is the discipline and freedom of mind. So a mm -hmm. lot of times in meditation, we do focus on the disciplining of the mind, but that freedom, that spaciousness of mind, to your point, I think is so very important. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you this because time mm -hmm. goes by so fast. You mentioned um, enjoying the science behind what Joe teaches. And also mm -hmm. knowing that Torsten is your Reiki teacher, I can, yeah, he's um, yeah. very connected to all of this as well. So I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you about your interest with Reiki in the medical environment, which seems to be coming up a lot lately. Mm -hmm. um, do you 
uh, work directly with hospitals there in the UK? Is there something that you want to create more of a focus around? What is your relationship with that? Yeah, I don't work directly with them, but I do run uh, an approved program, uh, which is approved by a, a body formed by the government called the CNHC, so the Complementary uh, and Natural Healthcare Council. So they were initially set up by the government or with the help of the government to give the public some protection. There were lots of different modalities popping up and people were getting hurt and didn't know what should be happening and shouldn't be happening. So they kind of look after or govern 14 different modalities, including Reiki, so massage and reflexology and things like that. But Reiki is one of them. Um, And so if you want to work in hospitals, the NHS in, in the UK or with NHS trusts, because there is a lot of scientific evidence around Reiki, the benefits of Reiki, even if they just look at the fact that it relaxes the patient. So mm-hmm. you can, you know, I have a Reiki master who goes into the the operating theater with her clients mm-hmm. to just really set the energy there and soothe them and calm them, as well as the the, the doctors in there and the nurses in there. Um, you know, there's a lot of Reiki practitioners in palliative care, end of life care. Uh, you know, and there's been a lot of research on how Reiki helps people just to just feel calmer, more relaxed, which in turn helps their healing. We go a bit further than that, but the medical world just kind of wants to keep it there. But there's a lot of research there. So in order for a, a Reiki practitioner to work in that environment, they want to know that you've done a lot of practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I run a program that doesn't just include Reiki one or two, but it includes a lot of logging of their treatments, case studies. Uh, they have to t- attend certain workshops, Reiki shares. So they're really kind of practicing their Reiki uh, quite a lot uh, and noting down the, you know, what they're seeing and the feedback they're, they're getting. Um, and so with that and the program I run, you have to be doing that for a minimum of nine months. So you can't just rock up, do a, a quick online course and then be in the hospital with their cancer patients. Yeah. They want to know you've taken a long time to do what you 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 say you can do. You've been doing a lot of practice um, and it's just wonderful. A lot of my students volunteer anyway for various hospices, St. Joseph's, St. Christopher's, but you don't need that kind of program, but they've already started that journey. Um, but some are also working in hospitals now, um, just bringing some peace to the patients who are end of life um, and they're getting some lovely feedback from them. You know, sometimes it can be heart wrenching when you, you know, you lose someone, but they've helped them to pass and transition in a really beautiful way and help their mm-hmm. families. And they're getting amazing feedback from their families saying how much they've helped them and helped them to come to terms with what's happening with their loved ones. Um, So beyond just thinking about healing is more transition in hospitals, but also helping people with operations. There's been a lot of research to show that if people are relaxed, they recover more. Mm -hmm. Um, If they, you know, tying that in with Reiki. Um, And so that the hospitals in the UK particularly, and I know in the States too, uh, because uh, I know William Lee Rand talks about this and and there's lots of research um, on various websites around Reiki. So it's having a big impact on the medical world. Um, And just bit by bit, you know, more hospitals are kind of setting up Reiki contracts and having people come in, volunteered and paid um, to give Reiki to their their, their patients and also to the staff as well. So they're seeing that benefit. That's um, so, incredible. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny. By the time this interview airs, there's another one that'll post right before this where I interview a doctor um, who lives in New York. So one of my teachers, she recently passed away about a year ago, but she co-founded an organization called Medical Reiki Works. Mm-hmm. And she co-founded with another doctor and she herself used to do Reiki and operating um, in the operating rooms. And Mm -hmm. so she developed a program called Medical Reiki and she wrote Mm -hmm. several books about it. But this Medical Reiki Works program is specifically where they are doing scientific testing and study to prove the efficacy of Reiki so that here in the States, a lot of hospitals do allow, you know, um, not in the operating rooms, but Mm -hmm. offered to patients and our Mm -hmm. hospice care as well. But they're trying Mm -hmm. to show the benefits so that um, 
uh, patients can have it as an option, more inclusive in their entire healing journey, post-op, pre-op, during operation. So it's incredible hearing you say Mm -hmm. what else is going on over there in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing. And Justin's done a lot of work, as you say. So he's proven that Reiki works. He's gone to a lab in Sweden. He's probably shared with you already. Yeah. And they've given Reiki to to water. So some know Reiki, some have some water with Reiki, right. beautiful starburst when they look at the water molecules. And then Reiki um giving water Reiki and with the symbols, even bigger starbursts. So mm-hmm. he's scientifically proven that Reiki works. Yes. We're 70 to 80 percent water. So it's going to work on us as well. The body mm-hmm. knows how to heal itself um every cell has this electromagnetic field around it and the information coming from reiki the light coming from reiki is helping with the healing but also the fact that the person's relaxed that's kick-starting the healing process you know they're right. releasing now lovely hormones that help them to to sort of speed up their healing um so yeah it's lovely that there's more work on the medical side going on in the states as well that we'll be able yeah. to kind of sharing over here but the doors are opening, which is really, really nice. Yes. To, and to I'm Reiki. so glad you said it because actually um, the woman that I interviewed, she's on the board of directors for this. I'm going to send her Torsten's information because I didn't even think of it at the time, but I'm very aware nice. of his work. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Connect Amazing. those dots. I know yes. it's incredible, <laughs> but I want to make sure to um, get to talk a bit about what you offer before you go, because one, a lot of the listeners are over there in the UK with you, <laughs> but you have some really cool upcoming events. So one of the first ones, which will take place on August 11th, is Eastern Yasui Reiki Techniques Workshop. And when I read the title, I thought, well, this is incredible because a lot of people may have only had exposure to the Western lineages, which are also beautiful, but it's incredible to also learn some of the um, more traditional foundations of Reiki. So could you tell us a little bit about this workshop and who it's for? Yeah, sure. So this workshop is for anyone kind of attuned to Reiki, ideally, um, because we will go through some sort of Reiki 2 techniques uh, on the eastern side. It's nice if we've done a Reiki 2 or at least are intending to do it. But the, the, the purpose is really to get them to trust their intuition more, immerse themselves in some techniques that allow them to get to the root cause really quickly. So the body scanning, Reggie Hall, which is third eye work. We also do group Reiki practice, which is so, so powerful to do. Um, We look at as well at uh, the power of Gosho, the meaning of this, when we see it as a mudra, Mm -hmm. we get a lot more understanding about what's going on when we put our hands in Gosho. Um, and also around, um, I, I show people how to um, cleanse an object. There's a really beautiful technique, Reiki technique we can use for that. Uh, and then we we connect again to the um, the symbols, to the kotadamas, the soul, spirit, word of the, the, the symbols, which is really yes. powerful to kind of chant and go through. So we're doing a lot of practice on each other with these techniques, but also sitting in circle um at you we're doing a bit of mawashi kind of sending the reiki energy around the circle we're doing some group work um but it, it's very very it's a, a beautiful healing day but a nice reconnection for a lot of people who have maybe not been practicing their reiki for a little bit yeah. um but yeah it's, it's it's that's kind of what's involved it is in person that one rather yes. than online um but very powerful day to kind of and join. is that in london it is yeah okay. it's in london in a place called sydenham gardens so it's a beautiful venue Um, I always like to teach or do anything surrounded by nature so we can go out and ground afterwards. That's really important for us. But uh, yeah, so that's if you're near Sydenham or can get um, a train to London, then you'll be able to kind of join us for sure. So yeah, that's beautiful. And then (laughs) you also have a Reiki meditation one day retreat. And that's Mm. in September, September 22nd. Is that open? to all levels yes that's open to anyone you don't have to be attuned to reiki so for some people that's their first experience of reiki um so this is basically what i'm doing is journeying through the reiki principles in this day the objective is to get people to maybe think about starting their own meditation practice so we do do various meditation styles we do breath work um you know but i also guide them through the principles so i guide them through a beautiful way of releasing um anger in their body through a meditation that i guide them on and it could be any emotion 
Um, so we do that work. We uh, we do some work on the heart chakra, opening up our hearts a little bit more. Uh, we go through the loving kindness meditation, metta bhavana for forgiveness. So be kind to yourself and others is working through that. Uh, we talk about worry. We do some journaling and we do some work on gratitude too. So it just brings the Reiki principles to life in a really yeah. powerful way that you're getting some healing too. Um, and everybody gets a Reju blessing at the beginning so they can bring that light sort of um, to the forefront more. But that's open to anyone. Uh, so as I said, most people have their first connection with Reiki through, uh, you know, that sort of experience, the, the one day meditation retreat, which is lovely. Uh, but that's also in the same place in Sydney, in London. Um, but yeah, you don't have to be tuned to Reiki to, to join me for that one. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yes. And then you also have one that a lot of people have questions about creating mm -hmm. a successful Reiki business and that's November 3rd. So could mm -hmm. you tell us um, a little bit about that? Is that also in London? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's also in London. This is uh, this was created because we obviously talk about setting up your Reiki practice as part of Reiki 2, but we don't spend too long on that, maybe about an hour or so on that. So if everyone's got the basics. So I really wanted to have a day with everybody um, where I can also kind of being a business coach to be, be able to coach them through setting up their business. Um, so we look at things like websites, we look at the, we look at finance, we look at Instagram and they have little checklists and things like that. But we also look at the energetic side of business. It's not just like the marketing and things like right. that. So we look at the fears that people have around business, which is kind of what you said, imposter syndrome. What if I don't make any money? Yeah. Um, you know, overcoming other people's objections, being seen. <laughs> so there's yeah. so many fears that we have. So the very first thing we do is we go around and we coach through all of that. Um, and we also, I also guide them through a meditation to call in their clients because everything is energy. Yeah. You know, yes, we can be on Instagram and be on the treadmill and doing all of that, but we have this hyper space. We have this internet in the sky we can connect to and call people in. Um, and so we kind of, uh, I guide them through that. And then we do, uh, which is a law of attraction tool. We do what's called act as if where we, we, they, I get them to partner up. And they do a bit of role play, just speaking what they want to into existence, pretending that it's a year later and they're actually just kind of going through, uh, you know, their, their whole lives and everything that they kind of want wow. as if it's happened. So yeah. a very, very powerful day. Um, but they get the practical side of setting up their business as well as understanding that the business is also an energy, you know, and it's not just... Um, you know, rock up and it should be, oh, I should be like Gwen, you know, understanding I've been <laughs> in the business for 10 years, you know, that, yes. it's that kind of thing. It starts small, it grows, you're building it, you're, it, you know, you're learning, there's no failure, it's a journey, your business is a journey. So that's the focus of that day to get them to see business differently, uh, something that they need to kind of sow and grow, as opposed to instantly rock up and be making X every, you know, they need yeah. to kind of, yeah that down yes well so it's I, nice to help them overcome their fears sorry <laughs> you know no that is a huge one mm -hmm. and again it goes right back to what your work is about and what we started the conversation around is the mindset piece and how important that is but i just wanted to let everyone know um because for those of us who aren't in london we still have an opportunity to work with you and i will say again your website, myspiritualbutterfly.com, you have a lot of beautiful content there. You also post videos and interview people and do beautiful things on YouTube and your um, Instagram, which is also at myspiritualbutterfly. But mm -hmm. you do coaching as well. So even for everyone listening, if we're not in London, we could still work with you. Could you talk about your, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah working with you outside of class? Yeah, definitely. There's many ways. So if you are going through anything in life, feeling a bit stuck, overwhelmed, um, you know, maybe going through some kind of transition in your life or, you know, whether it be, you know, it could be anything, it could be divorce, it could be leaving work to do something you want to do permanently um, or even relationship, as I said, which is my forte, <laughs> then yes. you can work with me on a coaching basis uh, where we work together from three to six months um, just to kind of, work on that mindset, build some more self love, self worth, but also give you some practical ways of approaching what you want to do. Um, so it's, it's a really lovely nurturing relationship, but it is for me, it's all about empowering you, helping you discover your power, 
um, and connecting to your spirituality, which is a big part of that. So it becomes a nice holistic journey, a mind, body, soul journey, um, where you you see the changes as you're going through that, check, that the journey, as opposed to waiting to the very end. And have I changed? No, all the <laughs> way through, you'll get that feedback. You'll see it from what's happening around you and the people you're, you're calling in. So that's transformational coaching, where I bring in um, normal coaching, normal, but vanilla coaching, standard coaching to kind of get out from you what you need to know, but also um, the energy healing comes into that as well. The Reiki comes in and uh, all the modalities I'm trained in. Um, and then the other way is business coaching. If you're a holistic business, I love working with holistic businesses because their their primary goal is to serve and be of service. But we have to work through all of the limiting beliefs that they have, you know, the imposter syndrome, as we mentioned, and all of those things. Um, but so long as they're kind of motivated, I'm able to help them set their business up and kind of get done the things they need to get done so they can show up and be the person they want to be. Um, so, yeah, they're the, the two ways to work with me. Um, I do offer group coaching, but I do that once a year called the Higher Goddess Ascension Program. Um, and the goddess activation programs and that's where I work with five women usually um, and we fall so incredibly in love with each other it's such a beautiful journey to take them through uh, that transition of looking at their goals looking at what they want to do but all of them are starting from that lack of self-love self-worth self-belief and so mm -hmm. we do all that work around that um, looking at you know their mindset looking at um, you know things like abundance looking at relationships um looking at that you know body love all of it is is sort of covered in that journey it's such an amazing journey yeah uh, so I'm going through that now so that won't start again till next year but one-to-one -one coaching we can start that at any time beautiful <laughs> thank you so much you. Gwen I have to tell you again I'm so glad that we met and for everyone listening again you will learn more about Gwen's work and very specifically she shares beautiful information and um, guidance for empaths in the upcoming Reiki Rays Global Healing Summit which you can access this fall so we look forward to seeing you again there but thank you so much for taking time to talk to us about Reiki and mindset today I really appreciate it oh, thank you so much for having me on Yolanda and allowing me to talk so freely it's just wonderful um wonderful questions that obviously just kind of elicited this from me as well so yeah. yeah thank you so much for being open to my work and looking at my work and sharing and and for the work you do bringing oh, this to people you. Um, bringing Reiki to people. It's just wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, my love. And we will see you all very soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Okay, beautiful alchemist. First of all, I want to thank Gwen. Thank you so much for coming to have this conversation about Reiki and mindset. Also, just want to remind all of you that you can learn more about Gwen and her work at myspiritualbutterfly.com. And if you are in the UK, if you can get to London, if you're close to London, don't forget about her upcoming events. You can learn more about all of that on her website as well. So thank you to Gwen. Also want to remind everyone that I have an upcoming uh, Oracle class. It is free on July 17th. If you would like to join the Oracle class, just sign up for my newsletter or download the Energetic Alchemist app. Either way, you will see the link to join and register for the class. I hope that you all have a beautiful day. Thank you so much for being here. And remember to always journey in love.